Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about um, how we do development at SUSE using Fissile. So usually when you think about developing for Cloud Foundry, um, you think Bosch Lite and the SDLC that comes with that. Uh, at SUSE, we're containerizing Cloud Foundry using this tool called Fissile uh, that we basically use to turn Bosch releases into containers. And we have to we had to implement other tools, other tooling around how we develop uh, for Cloud Foundry. So that's what I want to talk about today. And I'm basically going to walk you through um, our command line tools, um, the Vagrant box that that we use, and how uh, and how we think some of these ideas might uh, feed into uh, the upstream process of development. Do you want to get a full <coughs> yeah. yeah, sure. Okay. So I, I will switch to the terminal uh, more often. So I'm not going to be in full screen mode all the time, just so you know. Okay, so you can find Fissile at uh, suze slash Fissile on GitHub. Uh, we're trying to make our distro uh, Cloud Foundry certified, which means we consume releases just like normal Bosch does out of the specs for packages and jobs and so on. So um, this is the typical Bosch Lite flow, uh, simplified. You do some code, you do Bosch create release, you upload your release, you do Bosch deploy, you test, and then you keep doing that until uh, your work is complete. So when we move to our workflow, it's similar, or we at least try to make it similar. So you code, you again do a Bosch create release because that's what Fissile consumes. Um, then you have to do Fissile build and there are a few commands there. Uh, you build packages, you build images, and then you build Helm configs. These are actually three separate command line instructions, but we have uh, uh, tooling around it to make it uh, easier for, for the developer. Then after you do that, you actually end up with Docker images in your machine that are the equivalent of um, essentially a compiled Bosch release that sits on top of uh, Docker images. And you can Helm install that. And then after you Helm install, everything is up and running, you test, then you code, and you follow this cycle instead. So just quickly, I'll go to the terminal. So I'd like to show you what's inside our development machine. So you usually have a Kubernetes deployment. You have a, a bunch of command line tools like uh, Kube Control. Uh, we have this tool called K that um, Aaron, uh, engineering manager from our team, developed, which is just awesome to kind of shortcut commands for, for Kube Control. So what I did just now is just uh, the blue piece shows you what I should have typed if I had used Kube Control. But with K, I can just shorten um, everything, essentially. So we have Kube DNS running and Teller. So those are the requirements. Um, the VM is already configured to have uh, you know privileged mode enabled for running privileged containers on Kube con on Kubernetes. Um, it has memory and swap accounting. Um, so it has all the prerequisites required to run um, uh, the SUSE Cloud Foundry distro. <clears throat> okay. So um, I want to get into uh, some details now. Um, how does this actually work? How do we build the images? It, it starts out with um, essentially a stem cell. We create the Docker image from the exact same process as you create Bosch VM stem cells. At, the, at almost the end, before you add the CPI-related stuff on top of that uh, VM image, we stop and we create a root file system that we then uh, turn into a Docker image. So at the bottom here, you'll see OpenSUSE Leap. So our stem cell is based on OpenSUSE. Then we have uh, another layer that we put on top that 
has some tooling <coughs> specifically for fissile based things. And it has something we call configin that essentially allows us to, um, to process Bosch templates. So this is a very important piece. We expose configuration as environment variables uh, to the users. And we have to turn those environment variables into Bosch properties that eventually have to make it into the, into the templates. And Configin is the tool that does that. And then uh, we have a packages layer. So we experimented quite a bit on um, how we put the packages layer on top of uh, the stem cell layer. Uh, first, we, we created a, a layer that was just specific to that particular role. So, for example, if you have NATs, uh, the packages layer would only contain NATs and whatever dependencies that has. Then we figured out that it, there is so much uh, overlap that the total download size of all the layers would be around 30 gigs. So uh, we figured that it's best to actually have a, a, a packages layer that contains all the packages in the system and then just differentiate with the final layer where you add the, the job pieces on top. So we have this huge package layer that contains all the packages in the system, and then the final layer differentiates each image. And uh, basically, the jobs are the templates, the control scripts, and so on, and our entry point, which is RunSH. And RunSH does everything that um, um, everything that needs to happen before you can call, uh, uh, before you can start up Monit. So it templatizes the templates, it, it processes the templates, um, <coughs> uh, it waits for dependencies and so on, and uh, eventually starts, starts Monit. So I can show you here. You probably can't see that very well. So here we have the stem cell that we use as a base for, for everything. And here we have the actual images. So <coughs> at the bottom, you'll see some packages layers. So these two guys, uh, those sit on top of the stem cell layer. And on top of those, we have the differentiating piece uh, for, for each role. So Diego Access, Post Deployment, API, NATs, and so on. So this is essentially what we end up with after we uh, run through all the fissile steps and we get our role images. OK. So now uh, I want to take you through how we configure fissile to actually provide us with all these images. And what we have is two YAML files that try to describe uh, everything that uh, Fissile needs in order to, con to create the images as well as the Helm charts. And um, this describes how we collocate uh, jobs, Bosch jobs, into each container image. It describes how secrets are generated, how our charts are created, um, how the environment variables that we expose actually get turned into um, Bosch, uh, Bosch properties. So I'm actually going to open up the, the role manifest and, um, and show it to you. Hope you can still read this. OK, so first, we have uh, roles. So it's just an array of roles that we describe. Each of these roles will become a Docker image. <clears throat> so for example, here we have NATs. We specify, hey, we, when NATs starts up, we actually want to run some, some, uh, some scripts 
to configure HA hosts, uh, to forward log files, and so on. Uh, we, we tell Fessile, hey, these are the jobs that uh, have to be put into that image. Uh, we describe the processes that are available. So uh, once Monit is up and running, these processes have to, have to be there in order, to, in order for the uh, container to be healthy. Uh, <clears throat> the tags here uh, mention that NATS is a clusterable role, which basically means that it, you can't, you need a stateful set, uh, a stateful set in Kubernetes in order to, to deal with NATS. So you need NATS zero, NATS one, NATS two, and so on. Uh, then you have scale, uh, a runtime capability. So these inform the creation of the Helm charts, and you have. Uh, how, how much can that scale? Uh, does it need any persistent or shared volumes, memory, and so on? Uh, we have to define each exposed port. So <coughs> communication inside of Kubernetes always happens via services. So we have to specifically instruct um, Kubernetes on how the containers will communicate. So we we have to identify all the ports in Cloud Foundry that have to get open, as well as their, their protocol. Uh, we have some hints here for affinity and anti-affinity. And uh, that's essentially it. So Fissile gathers all this information, uh, creates a container image out of it, and also creates uh, a Helm chart. So this is the image piece. I now want to take you to the configuration piece here in the role manifest. So <coughs> let's say cluster admin, cluster admin password. So now we're in a section of the role manifest. This is a pretty big file, but uh, one thing to remember is that the, con the, the customer never sees this. This is just a development tool that we use for Fissile to, to generate everything we want. So uh, it's sometimes difficult to work with because it's so large, but um, see, it, it seems to do the job. So uh, <clears throat> here we have a definition for cluster admin password. So this is a setting that will actually expose to the customer inside the Helm chart. Uh, we'll see that in a second. And we, we have some information about it. it this is a secret. Uh, it's immutable. Uh, we have a description for it, and it's required. So you can't, uh, basically that instructs that we cannot generate this value. Uh, it has to come from the, from the user. And it's a secret, meaning it has to be treated like, uh, like a secret. We also have um, uh, other definitions of, of environment variables, things like certificates. So uh, let's find one. Yeah, console agent cert. So we have um, a descriptor here that basically says uh, we're supposed to generate this. This is a cert. And then we, we're working on a Helm plugin that will actually generate all the certs uh, self-signed uh, using this, this information. So <clears throat> we've seen so far that the role manifest has information on how to build the images. Uh, it has information on what configuration we expose to, to the operator. And now uh, I'd like to show you how we tie these uh, two things together. So how we go from the configuration values that the operator specifies to the actual Bosch properties that have to be put inside the, inside the templates. Okay. So we'll see here, it, you might recognize some of these. These are actual Bosch properties there. So <coughs> acceptance test admin password, that's a Bosch property from the acceptance test, for, from the Cloud Foundry acceptance test. And we, we basically tell Fissal that, hey, when cluster admin password is set, it should ha you should put that inside of the uh, admin password value for B Bosch property. And we kind of see that we need cluster admin password a lot, just like other uh, configuration settings in Cloud Foundry. So we can expose one environment variable and use it 
in multiple locations inside these templates. And these are mustache templates. So you can have a bit of logic there, but not too much. But essentially, it allows us to do um, <coughs> to simplify the um, to, to simplify the experience for the operator. So in the end, we essentially distill all the uh, configuration settings uh, that that come with Bosch properties, and we distill them into what we think should be exposed to, to the operator. So we don't expose everything that you could configure using Bosch properties. We expose things using environment variables, and then we turn those into, into Bosch properties. <coughs> and you can see here that uh, given, because these are uh, mustache templates, uh, you can kind of do cool things and, and protect the operator from having to type uh, uh, weird things like this uh, um, sim users uh, property and just feed in the password into that, that string. Okay. Uh, now I just want to show you the opinions file. So. I just took you through the configuration options that the operator sees. But there are other configuration settings that we bake into the images themselves. So essentially things that we want to override when we build the images. So for example, um, the CF admin username. We always want the uh, first user that gets created inside Cloud Foundry to be the user admin. And <clears throat> for example, for this setting, we don't offer the operator uh, uh, an option to configure this to be something else. For example, the CCDB, we always know that it's going to be on port 3306 because that's what we configure it to listen on. And we have uh, a network that we work with, and we actually stand up the MariaDB Galera cluster. And uh, so we always know that it's going to be 3306 the operator never needs to worry about, um, uh, about this property. OK, so that kind of explains uh, where we gather all the information to, to generate the images and the, uh, and the Helm charts. So next, um, <clears throat> we have a make file. It has a bunch of targets, uh, basically, for uh, everything that we need. And we use these targets to, um, um, to compile, to build releases, uh, to essentially do uh, all of these pieces that I, uh, that I showed uh, earlier. So for example, I can do make compile. Now, I've pre-compiled this because it takes uh, a few hours the first time you do it. Uh, we do have a bunch of caching mechanisms, so uh, every time you change something, we only try to to we try to figure out what the delta is. So if you've just changed one package, we'll um, of course first Bosch create release will detect that only that package has changed, then we'll detect that only that package has changed, and we'll just compile that package for you. Uh, after that. Um, <coughs> To speed up development, we try to figure out uh, how to place that package on top of the packages layer so we don't have to rebuild it all. So you can imagine that if we, um, you have that three gig layer of, uh, of packages that sits on top of the stem cell layer in Docker. Uh, if I change the cloud controller, for example, I don't want that entire layer to be built, uh, certainly not while I'm developing. So what we're doing is we're figure out, figuring out what's the closest package layer based on uh, labels that we set. What's the closest package layer that we could use in order for the delta to be minimal? Well, we take that package layer, we, we use, we build from that, uh, we put your changes on top, then the jobs, and then essentially you can do make run. So our goal is to to make development as fast as possible, so you don't have to wait for things to compile and, and so on. So 
like I said, we have a lot of make, a lot of make targets, uh, <clears throat> and one of them is make run. So, oh, not that. So what make run does, and I've just, uh, I should have showed you the actual running system before I, I did this, but uh, now uh, everything is going to get deleted and um, and redeployed. Uh, hopefully DNS uh, stays up. So, okay. Okay. So we'll we'll, we'll try to do this and and deploy live. So what happens is when you when you do make run, a Helm install occurs. Um, namespaces get created inside of Kubernetes. Uh, we have one namespace for UAA, one, one namespace for CF, and then all of the Helm, uh, Helm templates get converted to kubeconfigs, and they, they, everything gets created at once, essentially. Uh, what we want to do in, in, in the near future is when you do a make run after you've changed something, I'll keep trying. When when you do a make run, we'd like uh, just the delta to uh, to to be uh, deployed. Uh, right now, we have uh, some issues with secret generation that basically uh, rotate secrets every time you uh, when you when you try to do a Helm upgrade. So obviously that uh, that doesn't work well. Okay, so I can't really run right now. <clears throat> I can do make run. Um, we, like I mentioned, we also have scripts for generating self self signed certs. Uh, they're based on the information that we put inside the role manifest. Um, we use a, a version file, so we have a lot of dependencies um, for for development too. So we have the CFCLI, we have K, we have Cube Control, Helm, uh, Fissile. So we have this uh, file that we use to basically freeze all the versions uh, for all the all the tooling that we have. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the way we do development is uh, we typically do a vagrant up from the SCF repo, which is public, so you could do it as well. You just vagrant up that thing. It'll share the uh, the source code, and from there you um, you ha you're essentially two make targets away from getting uh, SCF up and running inside of it. Uh, it will take a long time because it it needs to compile everything and and download everything. But again, once uh, once that occurs, everything will be pretty fast. Um, we do use a well-known IP. Uh, to make things easier, uh, we have cf-dev.io pointing to it. Okay. So next, uh, we kind of figured out that uh, it's all about configuration. Uh, this is the the hardest part we think about Cloud Foundry is, is configuring it and making sure that um, uh, that configuration that you expose to the operator is easy to understand. So we've done a lot of work, as you've seen, to try and distill uh, what we expose uh, to, to the most relevant things. Uh, but this causes us. Uh, uh, a lot of hassle uh, when we do development because you've seen those mustache templates are not uh, easy to work with. You know, it's easy to have typos and so on. So um, we did a lot of work with trying to uh, trying to make sure that those mistakes don't happen. So we have linting code, we have validation code built uh, straight into Fissile. So if I do f uh, make validate. I have to rebuild this. 
Hopefully it'll stay online. Okay. So we do a lot of validation for uh, for everything, essentially. Um, we look to see um, which Bosch properties are defined in multiple jobs and which ones have uh, conflicting uh, defaults. And that actually happens. So you can have the same Bosch property that's exposed and it has uh, different defaults inside of, uh, inside of the releases. Um, we try to make sure that all the environments that are exposed to the user are actually being used inside of the mustache templates that you saw. Um, we want to make sure that all the scripts, uh, so all the startup scripts that we define for the roles, that they're all being used. So a bunch of, uh, a bunch of validation and linting code that uh, essentially is reusable. So if you were to dockerize or containerize another Bosch release, uh, you'd, you'd have all these uh, all these features. <clears throat> okay, so um, to sum up, uh, everything is open source. So we'd love we'd love it if uh, other people tried to to actually use the style of development and try to. Uh, work with a containerized version of Cloud Foundry. Um, uh, it's currently in beta state, um, so the um, S oh sorry. There you go. So uh, the SCF repo that you see there uh, has some releases. Uh, the latest release is a beta one. You don't actually have to run the dev version of it, so go through all of the things that I mentioned here. You can deploy it on a cube if you have one. Uh, just download the, the Helm templates from there and follow the instructions in the wiki. Um, <clears throat> and we currently use uh, OpenSUSE Leap for the stem cells uh, and the stack. So we added a new stack to the build packs, uh, which is we went from one to two now because we just had CF Linux FS. And um, we also have a UI for Cloud Foundry that we're, um, that's going to be part of the incubator. Uh, it's a very cool UI, works with any distro of Cloud Foundry. It actually allows you to manage multiple, uh, multiple Cloud Foundry endpoints at the same time. So all of this is open. You can, you can test it out. Uh, and if you follow the, that wiki there, um, you get running pretty much in no time. And that's it. Do you have any questions? This is the... Uh, They're both working. Excellent. Any questions? Thanks if, first for waiting till I got all the way over here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought there's somebody else, right? So um, it, it seems to me that like some of the concepts that you've just shown might have some commonalities with things that I would find in in Bosch two and, and also in Cretup. Is is there any any thoughts around like how that fits to to what you're doing in FISA? So um, there's no parallel from Cretup specifically. But for the rest of the for the rest of the things, we definitely try to make sure that uh, we're we want to be at least on par with what you can do with Bosch and what you can do with Bosch while developing. So all the nice things that Bosch does that it you know it figures out that that there's a delta when you create a release and so on, and uh, just uh, deploys the pieces that were changed uh, when you deploy. We want to have that as well. So of course there there will be commonality and it's uh, it's by choice that's that's what we want to to happen. Okay, thanks. Do you have any other uh, uh, Bosch releases that weren't the Cloud Foundry stack that you've sort of or smaller ones? Say I, I wanted to sort of get a feel for how I might do this to my own Bosch releases. 
Yeah, so actually we use uh, a bunch of small Bosch releases from Bosch I.O., like the NTP release, as one up? test assets for, for Fissile. There we go for time before I go and ask for questions. That, uh, can you yeah. just bring up which example? Uh, sure. Because Cloud Foundry is huge. If you were trying to try and figure out how to use Fissile, you might get lost in that. Uh huh. I've read everything. Okay. So yeah, uh, we use the NTP release as a test asset and also the Tor release. Uh, so I, I don't think we have uh, the role manifest uh, as you're probably asking for it, like uh, just a, a nicely put together repo uh, for you to test out. But that's that's a good idea. We could we could do that. Yeah. I thought you were asking from like a compatibility perspective. No, uh, purely from a uh, you know I, I manage many Bosch releases mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, and the idea of, of being able to describe a complex system in one format like a Bosch release. Mm -hmm. But it becomes available to people who, who are you know using Helm and haven't yet found the other reasons for using Bosch. That's right. It's better than you know having to recreate everything. And yeah, so yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, to me. we'll definitely take a look at uh, setting up a, a small sample for Fissile. Any other questions? All right, please put your hands together.